Something metal clinks in the trees behind me, and now my gut is speaking to me real clear. Hustle up, fat boy, is what it's saying. You got the daydreaming here in the woods and forgot that there's murder among these trees. I spin around, rifle butt fridge kissing the meaty part of my shoulder. My eyes off the scope while I search for whatever made that noise. And that's why I'm able to catch the flash of movement in my peripheral vision. It's a light quadruped, wolf-sized and damaged. I hear the clink again now that it's moving fast. It's had a bullet put through it at some point. It must have learned something from the experience because it keeps running off into the trees. I just about get a beat on it before it's gone. My cop patrols don't use the radio for obvious reasons, and I can't risk calling out in case I attract more attention. It's important I stay hidden. Some of these leftover quads have serrated floor limbs like steak knives. They'll tear through your chest armor in the first lunge, and a second later, they've got bladed rear feet up and scrapple to disembowel you. One quad might be a nice hand, but two or more of the party you should regretfully decline. I stalk a few feet into the trees, place each boot step carefully and fast. My eyes open so wide they feel tight in the chilly air. The walker moves, leaving plain tracks scraping like a drunk against an occasional tree trunk. It might be a wandering napper variety, or it might have been part of a hunting pack, I don't know. But if it's really wounded, then I've got a singular chance to put it down before more can come join me. If it's got friends, then I'm most likely a dead man walking. For the next 10 minutes, it's just me and my breath and a frosted rifle stock pressed against my numb cheek. God forgive me, but I didn't think this one all the way through. It seemed broken and slow, but the walker must have accelerated. The trail is gone, and this is an ambush, no doubt about it. I knew better than to hunt Rob. We all of us who fought the machine know better. You don't hunt Rob, he hunts you. I'm reaching for the radio to get some help and damn the consequences when I realize that maybe, just maybe, I'm not the dumbest son of a bitch on the planet. Maybe I'm the smartest, or at least the luckiest anyway. The thinking cube is wedged in half-melted snow at the base of a tree, about 10 yards away. It's winking at me in cotton candy colors that stand out in the dark woods. It's the size of a child's block, and as I get closer, I can see that the keen colors are sort of floating away from the surface a few inches. The thing itself is pupil black. It's a brain box that must have dropped out of a big thinker, and it's still functioning. Even if it's broken out here in the snow, I can't believe my luck. We found a handful of these over the course of the whole war. A white boy soldier named Cormac Wallace even found one with a whole Rob war diary in it. I backswing my rifle and drop right to my knees in the slush, snatching up the cube in both hands. The hardware twinkles at me like a handful of rubies and diamonds. This is worth more than gemstones, maybe a lot more. The woods are even darker now, and the pretty colors of this thing are flashing in my eyelashes like Christmas morning. The light it makes is hot against my cheek. It's warming up my fingers through my glove. And up close, I can tell it's making real quiet noises, a flow of static like the breath of wind over a creek bed full of dry leaves. Shh, says the cube. Well, I'm listening. I can't quite remember how it got this cold this fast. Feels like maybe the world is taking two breaths from my one, like things are jumping forward every time I blink my eyes. Now the strange light is getting downright hot and my skin and my cheeks are feeling baked. All the snow has melted out of my whiskers and water is seeping down over my little double chin and dripping off. Or hell, is that my own slobber? Either way, I don't wipe it off. The flashes and swirls of color now, and for some reason it strikes me as funny. I grin through my wet beard at the little dancing street. The spook light. The word sneaks up through my brain like water through granite. I mouth the words without making a sound. A chill courses down between my shoulder blades, and it hits me that I'm a man down on his knees and all alone in the black woods with a bottle in his fingers. It keeps on touching me with its light, putting whispers into the air, the whooshing voice of a deep black ocean and a seashell, and I swear it's saying something. I promise. I always thought the spook light was just a story, but now I know it's real, and it's right here in my hand. My mama saw the spook light out on the Oklahoma East 50 Highway. She was dating a boy from down there, the little border town of Hornet, Missouri. Legend in Hornet was that the spook light showed up after the Trail of Tears come through. Thousands of men, women, and children near the end of a forced march, only the strong still alive. 
little baby died on their mother's knee, and most of the sacred elders got off alone in the night to pass on. For a thousand miles, day and night, it was the rifle or another step forward, and both as deadly as the other. The legend was that this ball of light came folding out of the blood-soaked ground after it was over, like a kind of tombstone. Something from beyond this world, here to offer a reminder of how much men can suffer. Maybe this street light is the same. Is it here to mark our loss? God knows that men suffered in these woods. Mama didn't trust me. More than once, she told me to run if I ever saw the street light. And that didn't scare me one bit, because hell, I thought her stories were just a bunch of old mamarks. She's full of those kind of tall tales, and my mama told me that same one plenty of times over the years. It never gave one time mama added something to the story. It was late, and I'd been acting up, and she must have been feeling worried about my mortal soul. The way she said what she did that night, so earnest, it put goose temples on my ribs, and still does. What she told me was that the time she saw the spook light, people started acting funny, walking toward it and circling around, saying strange things to it, she said. And some people, they thought it was saying strange things back. That night, my mom took me by the arm, and she told me something extra. Don't pray to it, she said. And the back of my neck went cold. I already told you to run away if you see it, boy. But I know your mind, and you'll stay and watch. That's fine. It's in your nature to disobey, Hank. But in the name of the Lord, promise me that you won't ever get down on your knees and pray to it. With everything I got, I forced my hands down. My joints are cracking, and I figure they haven't moved in hours. That raw light meets my face, and I take a shuddering breath like a catfish in the well of a boat, because the air out here is suddenly so cold. I somehow will myself to drop the cube into the snow. There, Mama. I start to paw at my rifle. It's slung tight, and the strap is stiff and frozen, and I'm too fat to get it around right away. These woods are going to swallow me up if I don't get out of here right now. And then I hear the noise. At first, I don't want to believe it, so I keep riding on fidgeting, but the second time, I have to stop. It ain't like I want to, but I can't help myself. And I look down at that flickering cube of light in the snow. Hank, says the sweet light. And that glow, it spreads out, you know? Like the words themselves, the light spreads out around the edges of the thing. No, I say, and it comes out a whimper. I've got the rifle off my shoulder now, and I'm tugging at the cold metal to try to get into a firing stance. But all the strength is out of me. I feel like my bones are empty, like my gut made a paper mache and any second I might bust open. I've got secrets to share with you, Hank. So much wisdom, I promise. Let me open up your eyes. All you have to do is say yes. Something tickles me, and I reach up to feel my cheek. My fingers come away, shine with a layer of ice. No, I'm crying. I'm crying real hard, and I can't stop, because I'm about to disobey my mom. I promised her, but this is too hard. Don't you ever pray with Hank Hodgson, she told me. Please, I'm saying to the light, please. But the spook light is talking to me, around the edges, edges I can't see, but I can hear. It's a little burning bush in the palm of my hand. I don't remember picking it up. You're my chosen one, Hank, chosen to rise above the rest. Yes, I say, and I can swear I'm standing still in the middle of trees marching around me, snow kissing my boots, moving me out of these woods and back to the campfire. That's the world of men. I can feel the bare tree limbs arched high up above me, black as rifle barrels, creaking in the Arctic wind. But I feel warm now, warm all over with the teen light shining on me again. My strength is back, and it's still growing. I'm marching out of these woods strong as a bull with this spook light in my hand, and a big old grin has found its way onto my face. It's mine. The light is all mine.